All right. So I'm seeing I'm Howdy. seeing people from the Guild of Savannah up there. Hello, Susie. <laughs> yeah, you're probably seeing people from everywhere. So happy yeah. Mother's Day, everybody. Um, and I would like to welcome everybody for another uh, coffee with the artist. This morning, Elizabeth is coming to us all the way from Scotland. And so she's been sharing a little bit with us before we started about um, how things are going, you know, and their lockdowns and everything there. Good morning, Elizabeth. How are you today? Good morning. Yes, I'm absolutely very well. So this is uh, mid-afternoon for us, uh, Sunday mid-afternoon. So I'm just straight out of uh, an online class. Um, in eco printing and, and uh, creating texture, the back of your print. So it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm always really generous with my time. So that was a bit of a, a different thing for me to say, I have to go now, I'm sorry, but somebody's waiting for me for morning coffee. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, I'm very well. It's lovely to be here and thank you for inviting me. It's really super. Yeah, um, I was, you know, I was gonna, start off, we usually start about talking about your creative journey. And, you know, I was actually kind of, um, I didn't know about your history with stencil making. Um, I was a paper hanger for many, many years and I hung a lot of um, um, historical wallpapers um, uh -huh. because I was one of the few people who were in the paper make, the paper hangers guild here okay. in Florida. Um, and I actually took a class in Asheville, which was through the London School of Fine Arts. And we oh, were yes. about making stencils and gold leaf and mm -hmm. all that good stuff. And so when I read about your stencil making, and then it made sense when I see all your beautiful Catazoni stencils. Yeah. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about your creative journey and, and how yeah. you got to where you are now so actually um you sent me uh, uh, those questions last night and i went i went through them and uh, a lot of the time you don't actually really think about you know where you come from unless somebody actually asks you and um one of the questions was uh you know when 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 did this all start and um i think when I was a little girl, um, I come from north, northern France. I only moved to Scotland in my um, early 30s. Um, and my family was very textile oriented, not artist textile oriented, because we were very working class. But uh, my grandmother owned this uh, old sewing, sewing um, singer, sewing machine you know, the, the one with the pedal. And when I was five, I was allowed to use it and I was taught how to use it. And uh, that was quite a lot of fun. And my mother worked for a textile industry, the textile industry there in Northern France. We had a lot of wool coming from South Africa. We, um, we processed wool and made knitting wool out of it. My mother worked for the, the marketing company of that, uh, that company, Penguin, which is closed for quite a few years now. So I've been brought up with a lot of soft stuff around me, but I was never, there was never any question of me having a, a job, earning a living out of uh, anything artistic. And I did business school as a first degree. I traveled a bit. Uh, actually, I, I spent some time in the US in my 20s near New York, which I really love to bits. Uh, moved to London, came back to France, went back to university. And all this time I was a business person. That's what I was doing. And it's only when I moved to Glasgow in my early 30s and I ended up with a young child having to rethink my life that I joined in this, um, this class in, um, so that was wall treatment. Well, it was decorative art, but I specialized in wall treatment. It was run by Christie's, uh, the auction house. Uh, so Christie's Scotland at the University of Glasgow. And we have a very famous uh, Scottish architect designer here, which he wasn't particularly famous when he was uh, alive, but very famous now, which is Charles Rennie Macintosh. And I got really taken by his work. So I had just a young baby and it was a great moment for turning my life around and starting something new. And I became a stenciler. 
So I did quite, for quite a few years, I was working at uh, recreation of um, schemes, uh, heritage schemes. I did quite a lot of work with the museums, with the National Trust for Scotland. I also had a store where I was uh, hand cutting stencil. It was the heydays of stenciling. Now it's a little bit, I don't know, it's had its up and down, but at the time it was really popular. And I was running classes and um, it was all go for quite a number of years. Um, and then I became a maker and that killed my business completely. I had no margin in that whatsoever. I was hand making, hand decorating things, selling to a lot of uh, stores all over the place, all over Europe with next to no margin. I was employing people. I had been I'd moved back to becoming a, a business person again, but um, running a, a craft business. Um, and I just let it go at some point. I had a, a period of time when I was again working for industry, but I didn't realize at the time how frustrated I was to not put my hands into anything creative. And I got an, an immense chance of coming back to this through the, the renovation of a 1900 house uh, slightly north of Glasgow. A couple had been uh, speaking to me for about two to three years, asking me to come and renovate their house. And I was very tempted to jump back in, but I was worried that doing this small job would not be a long-term plan. Uh, eventually I gave in and I think at the time I signed this contract, I was in for a couple of months and I stayed a couple of years. I renovated <laughs> one after the other, <laughs> each room of this house. It's a listed building um, by the architect uh, designer, George Walton. And it was an absolutely beautiful, beautiful house. Lovely couple to work with, uh, a listed building, lots of regulations, but lots of really interesting background in the work. And I started back my journey through the skill I knew, which was making stencils, recreating interiors. I'm not quite sure when the shift came to back into textile, but somehow I found myself eco-printing. Don't ask me how this happened, it just happened. Um, and there was no, there's no, no way back from that. Eco-printing and indigo dyeing is just, I live through it, it wakes me up in the middle of the night. I cannot see myself doing anything else. This is not a hobby, I live off of it. I work 24 seven. Um, my husband thinks I'm absolutely off the trolley to work that much at my age, um, but I really love it. It's, I'm so passionate about everything I'm doing. I meet so many great people um, and you know, it's just a, a really big passion. I don't know how I lived all this life without dipping into this earlier. So yeah, it's, uh, that's me now. So I run a studio, I'm in Glasgow. I'm actually very much in my studio all the time just now because of the, the COVID <laughs> crisis, um, which has given me the time to do a lot of personal work. A lot of those things I'm working on just now happened because I've been stuck in this room for a year. Uh, instead of gallivanting all over the place running classes. So, yeah, it's a very nice place to be. So do you think that your creative creativity has changed a lot um, as you've gotten older and through COVID? So I think that, yes, definitely. Um, I think through COVID, you know, COVID is a terrible thing. I've had uh, quite a few people I know who have uh, passed away from it. Uh, it's definitely changed our way of life. I haven't seen my daughter since August last year. Um, we, we normally, as a, as a couple, we've been traveling a lot to Asia and we haven't traveled in months. So it has been a big, big, uh, big change for us. But what it has given me is a focus. Instead of packing my car, like I'm moving house to go and run a workshop somewhere. I have been working online and I've reclaimed a lot of time to myself, which I didn't have before. So that's been the big change. Um, also teaching to, I mean, Scotland has a small population and teaching face-to-face -face classes here 
I always struggled getting the numbers. Um, but moving my classes online, I've suddenly gained a lot more participants um, and I've had to let go the complete control. Every time I start a class, I explain to people that I can only do so much to help them because they're working from home and they're controlling the material and the equipment they are working with. And I think that's, to me, that was a very big change in the way I was working because I'm a bit of a cultural freak. I don't know you, uh, Suzanne, but I like to know what people are using, how they're using it. And I'm the kind of like, you know, snap on your hand if you're doing something wrong during my class. But I can't do that because people are away. So they will be watching me drinking their coffee, patting their dog. And uh, while I'm doing all the hard work, and then they will be applying the technique as they want. So I've had to adapt a lot of my teaching to this, uh, to for me, let go a bit. So not get too upset, but also I have had to take a lot more questions, different kind of questions, different approach. So I've developed a lot of the work that I've done this year because of this more time and more inquisitive minds around me. Um, so yes, so there's been a lot of negative things about COVID, but for me, um, a bit of a progression because of that. So I'm quite happy. I'm not sure I would go back exactly, even if everything opened 100% tomorrow, I don't know that I would go back exactly to the way I was before. I think I would keep some of this time for my own, my own work and my own personal um, development. Yeah. Yeah, I found the same thing. Um, I know that like before when my classes were like back to back and I had a different group coming every week, I never had any time to do any work of my yeah. own. Uh -huh. What little bit of time I did have, I found myself doing things that I could do quickly. Just Sorry, I'm having a, some problems. So here we go. I think that's better. But yeah. I found myself doing things that I could do quickly so that I could have some inventory. But yeah. with COVID, I actually was able to do some things with intention. And yeah. Them and experiment and do larger things. And I actually, I'm, I'm like, right now I have two shows going and I haven't had stuff to put in an exhibit in years. Yeah. And yeah. for me, that's something that I think I'm going to carve a little more time out for, my, for myself. Um, I'm finding this, this whole week, like I said, I have this bigger class coming in next week. Um, so I have found that I kind of took every table over for myself in the studio. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm trying to put all that stuff away so I have room for the students to come back, you know? Um, but, you know, so um, I don't know. Do you find yourself in the trap of, you know, being too busy? I know you said your oh, husband. You're nuts and <laughs> I, I work like nuts all the time and I, I have always been like that uh, I don't think it's possible to change me and I moan all the time about being too tired but actually I just pile it in as it comes so this weekend I'm running two master classes online and I had two talks and that's absolutely just completely crazy you know I don't know if, uh why I do it, but I just do it. That's just the way I am. I think I work well under pressure. But what I found though, uh, with the COVID, not having to have so many people around, um, which is sad in one way, you know, I'd love to give somebody a hug at some point. But on the other hand, um, because I'm working remote all the time, I can choose when I stop the discussion. So if, I, if you have people in front of you, you just have to deal with it. But if you're dealing by text or email, you can decide when you stop. And I have more time for thinking. So you were talking about you being more creative. I think one of the reasons I'm more creative is because I had a lot of headspace for myself. The creative process, I think, um, a lot of people say, you know, how, how do you think your ideas? I have this funny thing that um, my family always laughs about. I say, I float my brain and literally I just empty my head and then the ideas come in. 
But I can only do that if I have an amount of space, an amount of silence. And I think COVID has given me that, that bit. Because I can switch off, I don't have to be on Facebook, I don't have to listen to music, and I have nobody here to distract me. So I float my brain a bit more, and I have so many ideas coming in, it's just mad. So, and then of course I set up another something and I get more busy. So yeah, it's, um, I don't know, it just happens. <laughs> it just <laughs> happens. I think, you know, um, for those of us who, who make a living doing this, you know, your, your mind is always on, on speed, oh. speed dial. Yeah. You know, you're totally. always trying to think of the next thing and what can I do and, you know, how do I, how do I get this across to people? Um, I'm looking at your samples behind you and I see you have some beautiful echo prints there and you have some, some of your printing, your Katazomi prints. Uh, do you cut, you, I, I know this is a stupid question, but um, you, had, you carve all your own stencils for Katazomi? I, so actually this is uh, through uh, screens. I've started using, uh, well, I've been running, so this is the third time around I'm running this series and it's the next class is starting like just after this talk. Um, it's a workshop which I call Indigo Story. I've helped over the years, I've got this big passion for Indigo and I've, I have learned over time um, with a lot of friends who, I have who are using Indigo in their working life. So not to teach, but to actually die for a living. So I have a lot of friends in Southeast Asia and they are Indigo dyers, but out of necessity. So they're not well off people who play around, have a cup of coffee and do a bit of uh, working in their vatis. They are actually in and out all day long you know, doing things, growing indigo, making paste and so on. So I have a lot of knowledge from this, which I have shared over the years with people just to help them setting up a vat and maintaining a vat because the maintaining seems to be the crunch. People know how to throw stuff together, but then as soon as it goes a little bit, they have no idea where to look and how to deal with it. So, so I think I understand the vats quite well. But it's always been my regret not to be able to go a little bit further than just do a few folds and dip in the vat. So this year I spent a lot of time working out of new techniques that I could um, deal with, but detaching myself from the, um, the kind of traditional uh, Japanese way of doing things and so on, but thinking a bit more my way. So I've been making I, I do a lot of screens for other techniques and I've been making screens and I've been printing um, on indigo or discharging indigo. So this is uh, actually, a, this is, uh, I have a, this rug in my studio that I brought back from Bali a few years ago. And a friend of mine who was on a workshop with me um, took a shot of it through the screen and made this little design out of it and then send it to me. So I made a screen out of it. And um, this is a resist paste then dipped into my, my vat. So uh, that's the kind of work I've been doing this year, which is, um, this is also another piece of work done with a screen and this is discharged. So if you don't understand the process, originally this entire cloth is blue. It's been dyed with indigo. I then discharged the, um, the alphabet, the Gothic alphabet in a resist print on it. And then I take away the rest of the indigo and only leave what was resisted uh, through the, the resist print. So you can only work on something like that if you've got a lot of time in your hands or you can do it in bits. And my studio is part of her home. So I can pop down for 10 minutes at midnight if I just want to <laughs> check something. <laughs> because I, in the first time I had a creative business, I had a studio in a different location and all those good because I could just close the door and think about something else. I found it really frustrating that in all this textile process, all these processes, 
you need to work on something 20 times for three seconds each time. And so it can take you forever to complete something unless you can be here all the time. So I tend to, I have, now that it's just me here, I have loads of space. So I can have my stuff lying around and I can do a quick go, do something else, another quick go, something else. So I've done so much work with this kind of techniques, developing the way I'm working with them. And the, this dress I bought, uh, when I was in Thailand the last time, I was told I was going to meet somebody in a university and I had nothing decent to wear. So I bought this cream linen dress, a big mistake because I never met the person. I used it for a dyeing workshop. It got stained with logwood and it was put in a corner. So I thought, well, this is all very well making a little sample like this, but it would be more valuable if I could apply this to a bigger piece and nothing harder than doing it on the garment. So I, um, I applied the screens that I make onto this linen dress and then dipped the dress into my ferrous vat a few times and it worked really well. So I'm not about to likely to wear this dress because it's so cold here, um, but it's nice to explain what you can do with the technique that I, I teach. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really like the, the time it's giving me um, to work on my own. That's another bit with the screen is also. So I love the all the kind of uh, Chinese, Japanese, Thai, Cambodian uh, alphabets uh, because I don't understand them. It probably says something really stupid, this. It's maybe also you know, an insult or a bad joke, but I don't know it. I just think it looks beautiful. So I'm using it. So, so that is, um, that's paste resist. That you so it's a paste resist, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't work with wax here. I just don't have the equipment. I can't work outside. It's too tricky. I did it when I was in, um, I went on to a workshop with the Threads of Life in Bali uh, a few years back. And I did it there, it was perfect. It just fell on the floor, no problem, it's just outdoor. But here I can't, uh, I can't use that. So I've been using resist, uh, resist paste. Yeah. It's not a, um, what type of resist paste are you using? So, um, so it's my own recipe, but I take it from, um, I think in Southern China, they use a recipe where they use a mix of, um, uh, whatever mineral salt they have around and uh, soya of some sort. So the soya uh, makes it really elastic. I've been experimenting with this because I think there are some good recipes of uh, rice paste around, but I find that it works for shapes. It doesn't work for very detailed uh, elements. And I find it quite strenuous to make the rice paste and you know cook it and so on so this is it's taken me a while to put it together eventually but it's fluid enough and i tried to adapt it to different things because soya flour is hard to find here but the soya seems to have it seems to create a skin over what you're doing and it's a really good resist for the um the indigo so I'm still working on it, but all those are test pieces. Um, and at the moment, it, it, it works well for me. It leaves an amazing detail. I was looking at it. Yeah. Really good detail on the Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. the idea, I use a screen to, to screen it through. Um, obviously, I have cut a lot of stencils, and you can do, you know, uh, that. Like a, like a screen that you would use for screen printing? For example, yeah, yeah. Or a screen like you would use with, you know, silk gauze. Uh, so I don't do that kind of printing. So I'm not really quite sure what you would use for that. Uh, but I use a mix of different things. I also discovered when I was working on that big house a few years back, you can cut stencil using loads of different material. Sometimes when you work on a building refurbishment, you've got this really awkward places to stencil. So the wall is like that, right? So your stencil, you have to, to fold it, 
But if you use traditional material, which is a hard card, once you folded it, you can't get it straight again. So then it does not adhere to the wall and you get bleeding. So it's a, a really big problem for all stencilers these that are working on historic building. But I found this film, a Kodak film, that is used by big companies that do um, quite a lot of uh, printing for, I don't know, architects or whatever. And when you cut it, it's easy enough to cut, um, but it will fold quite well. So I think you have to experiment with the material that's around you, because I found um, with these techniques, you always find something that works terrifically well, but you can't access it because of where you are located geographically. So I think the best is you have to have a name for what you are trying to achieve. And then you've got to observe what your local resources are around you and adapt a little bit. Much less frustrating than trying to find something you can't access. So what, what type of indigo vat are you using? I think I saw I've oh, been noticing some I'm, posts you've made lately on Facebook where people are talking about vats. And I have many vats. I don't know. If I turn my camera, you may be able to see. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll try. See what happens. I have a different camera here. And let me see if I can show you. Okay. So you can't see too, too well, but you can see my two windows with all the bars. And to the right hand side, uh, you can see three big tubs. Uh, unfortunately, I can't move because I'm linked with a cable. But the large blue one is, uh, it's a fructose vat. It's not a very uh, dark vat. It's quite a, a weak fructose vat, uh, 150 liters. I've got a, a 65 liter of very strong fructose next to it. And the big red one, it's my new baby. It's a uh, hundred liter of ferrous. I am still experimenting with the shape um, of the vat. So the red one is quite wide. So you can fit in a garment. I'm not a scarf making person. Uh, and I'm very limited by the fact that I have to work inside uh, with not a direct uh, entry to the outdoor. The little tubs on the, the stools over there, they are uh, hydro vats. Now, I don't really like using hydro vats so much, but um, I do, oops, sorry, I've switched off my camera. I do use them um, from time to time because you can do cool things with hydro because it's a fast reducing uh, agent. So for example, uh, in some of the Facebook groups, there were quite a lot of questions about, can you paint with indigo? So I found I can do that with a hydro vat, but with a fructose vat, it just simply does not reduce fast enough. So I'm left with some yellow marks, but it never turns blue. But with the hydro, it does. So I, cannot, I can't choose, I love my fructose vats. Um, but I'm limited to what I can do with them. So I have to go the full way. Yeah. I think having a vat, you know, I think everybody gets used to what is there, works best for them. Yeah. Um, you know, myself, I cannot maintain a fructose vat. You, you know, I, I have too many people in the studio. I could if it was for me myself, but for studio and people coming in for open studio time and and just you know and and the administrative part of running the studio and then i yeah. let things go for a long period of time so i use hydro vats for my classes i use a um iron vat for myself yeah I can bring that back quickly if i let it go and i get nice i use i work a lot on linens and i can um, get dark colored out of it. Dark. Yeah, yeah. That's what I like, the, the dark color um, from the, the ferrous fat. So I'm trying to pull away from the hydro, but you are totally right. The, the hydro is a fast reducing vat. It's very easy to revive as well. And when you have a lot of people, 
until last year, I was teaching quite a lot of uh, classes to children in different schools and organizations. And when you have 100 people dipping in and out like mad, not understanding the do not drip in business, then it, they kill the vat so fast. Um, so the hydro vat really helps with that. Until this year, I was never able to have all those vats working together at the same time for a long period of time. So I used to have to revive them, but this year, because I'm here all the time, I really maintain them. So how are you doing the heat on your fructose vats? I have, um, I have a little, um, it's like a, a glass rod. Um, it's a fish tank heater. Okay. So, and that keeps a constant temperature of 30 degrees. But the fructose fat is not just the heat, you have to feed it regularly. So if you don't stir it every day, it just goes. I find the ferrous, you can leave it alone for a bit and then it revives reasonably quickly. But the fructose, you have to feed it, you have to use it and you have to stir it. It's like a baby. It's like a baby. You know, I had the most remarkable thing happen last a couple of weeks ago. I did an art artist in residency at our local high school. Okay. And we I went into the to the high school. I spent two days with all the art classes. So there were six periods of students all day. And we did batik and shibori on on COVID masks, cotton masks. Okay. And you know, those kids were absolutely remarkable. I had six classes of students using three gallon hydro vats for two days. And those hats maintained their color so well because they were so careful. Well, I'll have a group of ladies who have maybe four or five women who come into the studio for, <laughs> for a, a day and they'll just, They'll just shake it up and down and move it and they'll be splashing and they'll be squeezing and they'll be dripping. And I'm like, please, but those kids listened so well. Yeah. And yeah. it was just, it was just such a great experience. Um, and that's why I use hydros vats in my daytime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you mind me asking what, what kind of age group was that? The children? They were high schoolers. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it was, and I had to do the exhibit last week. And so the other thing that they did is each student wrote a paragraph um, and they, about how COVID affected them. And we ran a timeline all the way around the gallery and they pinned their, their um, COVID reflections on it. Yeah. That's it was good. really a powerful experience. Yeah. Yeah. I love working with kids. I love working with kids. I think they are they are very creative without having the fear of the adults. You know, I've never had a kid coming to class saying to me, I'm not very artistic. And yet I have so many adults who do um, and end up doing beautiful things, by the way. But um, yeah, I, I, I miss that. So I'm hoping that we, we get back to that because I've been doing things regularly with some of the local schools. We have a botanical garden not far from here. And uh, usually uh, beginning of the autumn when the school starts again for us, I have some sessions in the, one of the greenhouses. So they do some uh, basic eco printing uh, and some indigo dyeing uh, in there. And they are absolutely a joy to teach. Yeah. So, so let's let's chat a little bit. I see those beautiful echo prints behind you. Oh yeah. That one looks so colorful. It's got lots of colors. Which um, one is that? The one to the no, that one looks oh, like this one? Yes. Okay. Very colorful. Let me move that side so you can see. Okay, this one. Uh-huh. Yeah, so this is a, a really special piece actually. Um, just before COVID, so in February last year, um, I was running, um, I don't know what we would call that, a Skillshare with uh, three different uh, communities in Northern Thailand. I've been traveling to Northern Thailand for 
15, 16 years as a holiday, but gradually uh, through being very often in Chiang Mai in the north and being involved in the Chiang Mai Design Week in December, I may, I've gradually met quite a lot of creative people. And when I go over, I always take the opportunity to spend a few days doing some dyeing or whatever, something with them. So I applied for some funding with the British Council to run this uh, uh, exchange program, exchange of skill. I did not get the funding, but I had made all the contact. So I decided to go over anyway. And I spent, uh, that was short of two weeks in three different locations. So the Chiang Mai area, the Sakonakon, which is uh, very well known for all the indigo, and Ubon Rajitani, where all the silk industry was um, and still is nowadays. So this was printed uh, in a garden called uh, of a, a gentleman. He's actually on Facebook. His, uh, his name is Mancraft. Um, he's a young lad. So he's a very good friend of mine now. He's a young lad who went to study at uh, Bangkok um, Bangkok Art University, and then went back home and set up this business in Sakon Nakon, which is the, you know, the, the high place for Indigo. Uh, he runs this dye garden there, so he runs a lot of workshops, he works on commission and so on and so forth. And I was over there for a few days. Um, so I was teaching eco-printing to some of his uh, local contact and a few of the, the university uh, lecturer there. And in, re in return, I got a lot of uh, insight into um, indigo dyeing with them, how to extract paste, how to transform it into a fermentation vat, et cetera, et cetera. So this space is very special because we printed it as a group there uh, during the, the three days. And I was given it at the end. I, we were going to split it, but then I was told that, no, no, I could keep it. The colors of the vegetation, this is my just my traditional uh, mordant I use for all my prints here. But the, the, the colors are just so bright. And there is a small panel, actually, which is underneath. I cannot get this brightness out of my own leaves. Um, here, uh, the green leaf, uh, the, the, the casual name for it is, uh, it's uh, called uh, belly bush egg. You find it in South America as well, I believe. Um, but it is very specific also to Thailand. It's a, quite a big, bright red leaf. And the, um, the flowers, the corypses, and they are just ever oh. so bright. And I think it's just the climate there, which gives you this really strong uh, vegetation. I particularly like the teak leaf, the young teak leaf always give you this really strong red, very dark red. Um, but again, I can't access teak leaves here. So really good memory. But that was a very special event there. That was really uh, very interesting. And since then, a lot of the people that I taught, I've now been kind of passing around this technique to lots of different uh, people. It was absolutely spectacular, um, really good moment to remember. So, and that was just before COVID. So, it, it's absolutely beautiful. Thank I you. Have, I have a lot of uh, Facebook pages I follow, which have printers in Asia. Yeah. And seems like their colors are are really vivid and really yeah. bright um, they don't get the dark muddy prints they're, they're no just, no they're no. just the, everything just pops out and, and I keep trying to translate and figure out what they're doing and and yeah. you know, figure out if they're using different mordants that we're not using or I think so, I, yeah. I think part of it is really the vegetation. The vegetation is really strong. Um, I think also they are using, well, certainly I came with my, my own recipes and then we adapted to the resources they can find. I mean, um, Minecraft man, uh, is quite educated to Western 
type dyeing and modernizing and so on. Uh, but my next stop was north of Chiang Mai in an area called um, Mei Cham, where they do a lot of natural dyeing and a lot of weaving of very complicated patterns. Um, apart from my friend Nusara, who was uh, organizing the, the workshop, nobody else spoke English and I can't speak Thai, so it was quite interesting. But um, we did a day dyeing. The next day, the weavers came back, they wanted to have another go, and they brought their own resources. So we worked from this block of alum, instead of a little sachet of powder, we worked from their own resources, which are, I think, quite pure. And I think that might be also one of the reasons why the results are just so vibrant as well. So, so I'm noticing on that piece behind you that uh, shibori type black. Yeah the center and the edges was that like folded afterwards and then yeah. so what we did there is we did a, a concertina fold we were limited to what we could use so that was simmered in one of their big um you know the big asian kind of three-tier uh, steaming uh, pots okay aluminium yeah so we had it was logwood dye which they don't really use there but i had brought some over um because i wanted man to try it and uh, that was simmered in a, a pot of dye. And it was one of these like uh, concertina fold uh, piece because we were limited to the, the dimension of the, the steamer. Uh, that was rolled with the leaves in the middle. That was rolled and that was steamer, steamer um, for about an hour, I think, in the pot in logwood dye. So oh, they really liked it. Yeah. I, I do think the leaves, you know, they change from, from one region to another. Um, here in Florida, we don't have the traditional leaves with like oaks and maples and yeah. that have all the tannins in them. And most of the stuff, I mean, it's, it's just pure experimentation. Um, yeah. A lot of the stuff that prints here are, are just vines. Um, yeah. that are things that are weeds. Do um, you have eucalyptus at all? Do you cultivate eucalyptus? Eucalyptus there? here in Florida is an invasive, invasive species yeah. and they cut it down. If you can okay. find a tree, yeah. the le it's, they're so big that you can't reach the leaves. So you have yeah. to just hope that a storm comes and they come off. Yeah. Um, you have to purchase it at either Trader Joe's or oh yes, yeah, I've heard about one of that. the grocery stores. Yeah, um, we do have a lot of you know we do have some things like coral vine. Um, we actually some of the some of the techniques um, were actually discovered here um, when Irit was here at my studio. We used. Um, Oh, Virginia Creeper. And oh, Virginia Creeper. Found out and big, found yeah. out how it discharged. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it was yeah. kind of like the birth of something, you yeah. know. Um, and so, you know, when you're printing, I mean, personally, I myself like very clear prints with color. I like yeah. to be able to see the, the designs, you know. But, I mean, everything has its own, its own thing. And... You know, when you're, what is the biggest, you know, we have a lot of printers on here. Um, what do you think the biggest mistake most printers make when they're starting off? One, being too ambitious. I think being too ambitious, wanting to work on very big pieces, um, wanting to print silk scarves. Oh my God, the number of participants I have who, come after having wasted so many seal scarves. That's a total nightmare. So I tend to, when I'm working with, um, with people, especially online now, if they are in the UK, I send starter packs and I send lengths of fabric in them. But nowadays I ask them to break them down to reasonable size samples and just to try, because I think you learn so much by just testing testing, 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 testing. And every time you make a mistake, you learn something new, which is great. Uh, if you are able to come to terms with failure. So I think that's one thing that I've never had a problem with 
Um, but I think a lot of printers, especially when they are using those Facebook groups, they don't appreciate, they don't understand the process, they don't want to understand the process, they want to get the result too fast. I think it's, it's a process which is beautiful if you learn it step by step, you can get beautiful results uh, gradually. So I am more about the process than the result at the end of the day. I am an eternal le learner um, and I, I just, uh, I love discovering new things. So you were talking about Irit. I worked with Irit in Holland. I, again, that was two, three years ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, working with new leaves and different things. And it was, uh, she's definitely my eco printing hero. Uh, if anybody at all, I really, really like her approach to things and the eternal testing that she's doing. Everything is tried and tested and compared. Yeah. Uh, so I think as a new printer, you just have to go through this and forget the beautiful big piece you've just seen on Facebook that somebody has made. If you don't understand the technique, you can't make it happen. So, well, yeah. the Morton King process, I mean, I'll have people coming for an intro class and they come and they bring lots of cellulose. They have no concept of the Mordenting process and they want to make something huge. And it's always like, what am I going to make in this? They want a thing. They want yeah. scarves. Um, you know, they, they come and um, it's very frustrating because I tell yeah. them, bring samples. You know, maybe take the same piece and do the same piece with different techniques, the same yeah. leaf over and over again until you know what that leaf is going, is yeah. going yeah. to do, even though you never know what it's going to do. You still yeah. get those elements yeah. of surprise. Yeah. But I think the testing and the working on samples, yeah, you know, is, is, is a big thing. But um, do you not think, um, so I, I don't know your age, I'm early 60s. Um, my friend Usara in, uh, in Northern Thailand is in her 60s as well. And we had this discussion last year. I think there is a big shift in the way people are treating things, craft things, from when I started my first business to now. And um, I was taught how to cook from first principle at home uh, by my mother. So you open the fridge, you see what's there, and you make something with what's there. Yeah. Nowadays, People, I don't know in the States, but in the UK, they take this subscription with these uh, companies that send them every week a box with all the ingredients to make <laughs> the stuff. That I think that's totally crazy, but anyway, whatever. Um, and people do the same with craft. So they're looking, they're looking at something and they want to make this. I think it's much better to learn the process and to work with what you've got. So I do a lot of work with recycled material. Um, before, when I was touch, teaching classes with lots of people, I made them use recycled material because you can make mistakes. It doesn't really matter. That material would go to the tip anyway. Um, and you learn uh, gradually your process. So Nusara is, uh, was saying the same about uh, people in Thailand is before, you learn and understand the process, and then you decide what you're going to do with this process. She said, nowadays people go to art school, they come to her and they go, we want to make this, how do we make it? Before you learn how to do things, and then you decide what to make with it. It's a big, big difference in approach, um, I think. It, it, there's, there is, I'm also, I'm also in my 60s and I've had to learn how to you know, start at the beginning and apply each thing one step at a time. And, you know, I, I find that I get, I don't want to say millennials, but the younger kids, they don't have the patience to learn it all. No. They, they want it in a kit. They want a step, you know, they want to be able to make something beautiful, you know, they'll come into the studio and they'll see a bag that I've made. And I started off by doing all the shibori on it. And then I made the bag out of the shibori fabrics that I pieced together. 
And then I've gone in and done shishiko stitching on top of it. And I may have in that bag 200 hours, 300 hours, who knows? It's just kept evolving and evolving. And they'll go, can I come and take a class and make this? And I'm yeah. thinking to myself, in what nope. do you want to <laughs> make this? Um, and, or I'll have students who come for a printing class and they bring 200 silk scarves and they want to make 200 <laughs> silk scarves to take to their next show. Yeah. They come yeah. to the studio yeah. and they want to make 200 scarves and take them home so that when they go to their next show, they have all these pieces yeah. that they can put in the show. And then they just, they don't want to learn the techniques and build a sample book. And um, that's really important to, yeah. to get those steps down. Yeah, so I, I did a, a workshop, an indigo workshop with Abu Bakr Fofana a few years ago. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic, phenomenal, such a good learning experience. Uh, so I think the workshop was five days and I kid you not, we spent three days, three complete days making a scale of blues so there was, uh, I think it was seven blues plus the white in little samples fabric like this, about this size, yeah. Three days it took us just to do this. You weren't doing shibori or anything like that. You were setting up some vats and dyeing your samples. It was a phenomenal experience. I learned so much through that process, but, and I achieved in my mind so much, but I went away with nothing, my little samples of blue and a lot of okay. knowledge. So, and that so was I, enough, yeah. So I'm gonna go back to indigo real quick here. Um, yeah. Dips. Dips. Dips, oh gosh, yeah. Dips, 20, How, 20, short, 20, short 20. dips, short dips or long dips? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for me, lots of short dips. Lots, Lots of, of short yeah. yeah. So it, it really depends. So something hit me the other day. Um, I'm on this indigo dye uh, group. And, uh, you know, sometimes you observe something for a long time, but you never actually put a name on it. Right. It doesn't actually ring a bell to you. And it's the, the reduction time of different vats. So different uh, reducing agent reduce faster or not so fast. Yeah. So it hit me the other day because there was a discussion going on about uh, somebody who was talking about when she dipped a fabric again in the indigo vat for 20 minutes, which I thought, oh my God. And um, when she pulled the fabric out, it, it had gone all green again. And I thought, well, you're re-reducing your indigo, which is already in your piece. And I'd never thought of it because I would never think of doing subsequent dips of that length of time, but then that's just the way I work. So for me, one, one longer dip to start with, and then lots of short dips, depending on the size of piece. But yeah, for something like that, you know, a few seconds, a, mi a minute at the most. Well, you don't want your, your, your paste to rinse off in your vat, so you want to go Actually, that was a, a ferrous vat. It's actually really quite solid. I was surprised about it. So you can't squeeze it really. Right. You have to up and down. So, yeah. So what about finishing your indigo when you're finished? Yeah. Oh, that was another experience in that uh, that Bali uh, workshop. My God, it, we did so much of a process to finish the pieces, but the pieces I've brought back are impeccable. They haven't shifted one bit. So, so if you're using uh, a vat which has lime in it, so that would be your ferrous on your or your fructose vat, you have to do something about the contamination of the lime. So rinse, 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 rinse. And when you think you've rinsed enough, rinse one or two times more. Um, and then uh, submerge your pieces into um, a basin of water, if it's a small piece, uh, with some vinegar. And that will neutralize the alkaline effect of the, the lime. If you don't do that, then your piece will start uh, turning yellow after a bit. 
A lot of people don't spend a lot of money on their VAT, lots of time on their Indigo, but don't finish the pieces. So, and that's really, really very important. But also I find, and it's the same with eco printing or with natural dyeing. Uh, I think because a lot of people don't understand the process, they don't understand the binding of the dye to the fabric. They don't realize that if you're rinsing something and it comes off, it will come off at some point anyway. So you better rinse it right away. And then you've got a clear piece, which is in its final stage. So I have a lot of people who have been coming to workshops and then when they read, they go, oh my God, this is running out. It's not, it's the unattached particles um, of dye. So rinse, rinse, rinse is the main thing. Well, this has been really great. And I think I've been hoarding the whole conversation. I thought it maybe I'd open it up and see if anybody in our uh, audience has any questions for you. Um, Actually, I can't see everybody's hands if you're going to raise your hand, but if you could maybe um, if we did it kind of just open your microphone and then ask the question and then wait until Elizabeth gets done answering it and then maybe someone else could could answer and I'll keep my my eye for people who have um, I put their hand raised up. Oh, Joan raised her hand. Hi, good morning. <clears throat> Thank you for, for this uh, talk. Would you kindly spell the name of the fellow who you worked with in uh, Thailand, I guess it was, so that um, I might follow him on Instagram? <laughs> sure. So I, oh, I can't actually, okay, I can't uh, put it through the chat. So um, the Facebook page, if you're looking at Facebook, is also on Instagram. And that would be man, M A double N, man craft. So uh, C R A F T? C R A F T, yeah. Uh, let me find out actually, just to make double sure. So, and he's a lovely person. Um, he also speaks a really good English. And Yes, it's uh, on Instagram. It's, it's m a double n dot craft. Uh, there's also Minecraft textile, and I think on Instagram it will just be Minecraft. M a n n. Yeah, m a n n space craft. C r c r a f t. Um, Thank you so much. So really worthwhile person. <laughs> Thank you. Very interesting. My pleasure. Thank you. I have, a, I have a question where you, this is Beverly Snow, um, where you say that you get such clearer, brighter prints in different countries. Do you think that's because of the water quality? Well, there are so many different uh, variables in yeah. uh, the way you get your prints. So I have a really good, I apply a really good mordant. Um, I work with a system which is very uh, similar to what uh, Irit works with, Michel Garcia works with, etc. And it gives you a really clean piece of fabric to start with. So you've modernized your fabric and then you don't the excess modern away before you start. So that already gives you a really good uh, starting point. It takes a lot of the muddiness away. But also, um, I think depending on the vegetation you are using, some That's vegetation true. the stronger tannin content and will print better. Depending on your steaming time, if you don't steam for long enough, then or or uh, simmer for long enough, you don't give your leaf a chance to actually grab the cloth. So there there are so many different variables. Sure. It's difficult to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank I, you. I have, I have a question. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I, I just wasn't sure what you said. You said um, you don't wash the mordant away, or I couldn't quite. Know. Okay, so there are different mordanting process around. Different tutors will ask, uh, will work with different mordanting process around. Um, the way I work with my pieces is I will mordant all the pieces uh, before I either dye or print. Uh, and then I will go through what's called a donging process. So this is a method, if you research, Mich Michel Garcia recommended this uh, a while ago. Um, 
when you modern your fabric, you actually modify the um, the chemical component of your fibers. Mm -hmm. But there is always some floating mordant, which is not bonded to your fabric, yeah, but it's there. So if you don't clean these uh, through the donging process, it affects the color and it affects the quality of your work. So I go, after mordanting, I go through a donging process, which is uh, very common in India, for example, where you eliminate, you neutralize the modern, which is not fully attached to your fiber. And that means when you then put your fiber into contact with other dye or prints, um, you don't have this polluting element in your pot. And that gives you a clearer result altogether. How, how do you spell that? I'm not... Uh, oh, donging. So D-U-N, uh, I'm not sure if it's G-U, uh, hang on, let me see. Oh, yeah. um, so, so are you using um, chalk, cousin, or, or so it's D U N G U I E N G. So and um, so the, the original process originated in uh, India and it's called donging because they use dong, animal poo, which has a lot of phosphate in it. So there's a, a few, uh, there's a few people talk about this in various manuals. Catherine Ellis from, was in her, um, the Art and Science of Natural Diet. She explains the process quite clearly. You can use a few things. So Susan mentioned um, chalk. You can use chalk, you can use wheat brown um, and various other things, but I won't go into them. I think the, the chalk and the wheat brown are the most common ones. So it, it does a couple of things. It, it finalizes the modern thing. It, uh, it helps for the modern to adhere to the fabric further, but it also neutralizes um, some of the elements of the modern. So it's a good process. I, I, also, I also actually wanted to ask you, um, do you have a Facebook or Instagram or anything? Yes, so you can follow, if you take note of my name, that's probably the easiest. So you can follow my own page. When you are on my own page, because my, my studio Facebook page is a really big mouthful, but when you are on my own page, the post that's pinned at the top of my page will let you jump on my uh, studio page. And then um, I'm curious about uh, behind you, there's, to my far left, there's, um, a piece that you've done that's, um, it looks to me like a gray, brown with white or behind oh, you. Oh, this yeah. one? Yeah. <clears throat> so this one, um, so this was actually a communal piece done um, in a workshop in Scotland a few years back. The gray behind the prints, um, it's a tanning blanket. So it's a tanning blanket made out of green tea. <laughs> so the, the cloth itself is actually a recycled damask table linen, uh, which was given. So it's quite big altogether. And I run this workshop for, it was actually the Scottish Felter Federation. Uh, so it's double the size, actually. So it's quite big. I like working on very big projects. If you got, if you jump on my Facebook page and scroll through the photos, you will see quite a lot of big pieces um, around. Um, we worked on these, and the idea was to create quite a lot of texture. So the blankets that we used, they they were all sorts of things. That's a bit of a baby's blanket, so quite textury. And we didn't. Um, that was the end of the workshop. We didn't have a lot of. Uh, stuff around so we used we made a very big pot of tea in a big bucket and dipped all the blankets in it and it works really well so <laughs> thank you okay so uh, magdalena you are muted magdalena you need to unmute yourself first okay <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how much? How many tea bags did you use to to make that? Oh gosh, I'm not quite sure, but a lot. If I run a workshop and I know I'm going to be using tea for tanning, 
what I would do is the week before, every time we have a cup of tea, I just chuck in the tea bag into a bucket. And at the end of the week, I make an, a massive teapot out of it. So just, you know, no more bucket, throw in a lot of very hot water and dip your blankets overnight. And that really works. So black tea works well, but it gives you a different color. But green tea gives you uh, gray like that. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Does anybody else have a question? It's awful quiet. <laughs> it's, I Hello, have a Betty. Quick Hello, Betty. Betty, Betty, go for it. How are you? I, but I can't hear you. I, I'm speaking through my, my earbuds. Through OK. My yes. Hello. And, it's uh, lovely to see you. Yeah, to see you too. And I, I finally uh, succeeded to, to make this coffee with the artist. I couldn't do it before. So I'm really lucky. Uh, That's and good. Uh, and I would want just to tell you that I just bought uh, some trousers from India, dyed in indigo, and I, it bleeds so badly. <laughs> yeah, tanning is a brilliant thing. Um, I've got a tiny piece here. So I'm not sure if you'd be able to see through the, the screen, actually. Can you see the, the multi printing in the air? So this is the class I was just teaching before I, I gave this talk. Uh, so this is an eco print originally done with a tanning background. Um, I think it's mirobolant tannin. I can't actually remember. But anyway, uh, um, Suzanne, it was using the same screen as I used for the, uh, my paste, but this time with a discharge paste, which eats away the, the tannin. So okay. that was about um, uh, taking away taking away dye so which was really good I love tannin all sorts of tannin and we all have so many different things that we can transform into tannins great, great medium to work with yeah so, so but it's lovely to see you I see many people that I know here, so it's very nice to have you here. I must say, I'm uh, I'm very sorry. A lot of the time on a Sunday, I'm teaching and I can't actually come to the morning coffee because there's been so many really interesting people there. Suzanne's made such a, a big effort to have uh, so many interesting uh, speakers. So yeah, I have um, three more left for this year. Um, um, I have uh, Rio Ren. And she's doing a thing on dyeing with tannins and iron. Okay. And we have yeah. Suzanne Tamar Deckler, Deckel. And she, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And I have Amy Nugent, um, oh. who is do, doing some, she's, I don't know if you've seen her stuff, but she does these beautiful shibori and fashions using all the different techniques. And then I'm going to take a little break for summer and I'll get started again later. I'm right now. Um, Putting, getting new teachers together um, so that we can start back up probably. We're, we're going to be traveling for some of the summer. So I, I can't rely on internet connection in, okay. in our RV. So I can't rely on internet connection to do them while we're gone. Um, but I, this has been really a lot of fun. I've met, had seen so many interesting people. And uh, I think the talks are getting they're getting better, you know, and, and I'm actually learning how to do the, the Zoom thing better and record them better. And I'll be recording the, each talk and they're going on the IF Fiber Studio YouTube page um, as I get them recorded and um, on YouTube. So are the talks, are the, the previous talks, are they on the page just now? Some are, uh, yeah. some 
are. I the some of the beginning ones I thought I was recording and I guess I didn't know how to record them. Yeah. When I stopped the recording at the beginning. I would forget to turn them on. Uh, or I would start recording at the beginning and I would get too much of the pre chatter. And then I would try to transfer them over to Vimeo or to Camtasia and edit them. So it yeah. took me a little while to get it down straight. And But I'm getting better at all this. Um, and hopefully by fall, we'll have a whole bunch of new instructors. Yeah. Um, Susan, let me tell you a funny story about this. Um, I've been running all my, my workshop lives live on Zoom uh, since last year. And uh, I record them because, because of having people in different time zone, I make the recording available for a month just to make sure that you know, people can catch up uh, on the technique. And it is advertised that people get access to the recording. So the second ever workshop I ran on Zoom last year was in French, the French group. Um, and I forgot to turn the recording on. Um, two participants were not actually present in the class, so I, it wasn't an option not to have the recording. So I completed the workshop, and then I had to rerun the workshop a second time. It was a three-hour workshop. I had to rerun a second time with just me, <laughs> just for the hell of recording it. I have never forgotten again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, I'm getting much better at this, and I'm begin. You know, it's been quite a, a challenge, but um, it's something I can do now if anything ever happens or if I need to. Um, and so that's a good thing, you know. I I started off. I think I waited a little too long. I was afraid of the process, uh -huh. and I was fascinated getting started. And I remember I did the first one, and I thought, wow, oh, well, that wasn't so hard. You know, um, you know, it just takes time looking at the screen like you're looking at people so your eyes aren't looking off into the world and, and like you're not even interested in what that there's anybody out there. Yeah, yeah. I but, find the, when you're teaching though, you, the screen is not so um, overwhelming um, because you're teaching, so you're forgetting about the screen. I mean, I look to make sure people are not looking completely lost or uh, they're understanding the process or just to make sure nobody has a question to ask, but, uh, or to make sure also I'm in the screen, that's another thing. You don't just disappear outside the screen and nobody can see what you're doing. But, or you're uh, switching from one camera to another, so you, you forget. To go aside and, you know, you spend all your time going back and forth. Oh yeah. So well, this has been really great. I'm I'm really yeah. glad to finally meet you. Um, and you, and one you. of the things yeah. that happens, you now I can have a face behind the name. Yeah. And so I think fine. that that's a good way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. But you know, I want to wish everybody a happy Mother's Day. And uh, you have Mother's Day in, in Scotland too. No, so in Scotland, we like to do things a little bit differently. Uh, in Scotland, the, well, in the UK, Mother's Day is the end of March, the last uh, okay. March, yeah. So it makes no difference because I don't have a mother here. Actually, my mother uh, died many years ago and my daughter lives in Germany. So it's uh, totally, for me, it's irrelevant. <laughs> but I wish all the, all the people who have Mother's Day here a good Mother's Day as well. So I think it's a very special day. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us and everybody else. Thank you for joining us. And I hope everybody has a really great rest of their day. Thank okay. you. Thanks thank a lot. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Suzanne, thank you. I, bye. One more question, Suzanne? Oh, yes. One more question. <laughs> I'm, I'm having trouble getting into the, the uh, uh, meetings. Now I got uh, the, the link from Elizabeth, but last time from Eric, I missed it. And I, I yeah. get an Eventbrite tickets and I then uh, don't know how to log you in. You know what happened with the Eventbrite tickets? A lot of people, when they get the confirmation email, they need to read all the way to the bottom of the email because there's a space at the bottom that says additional information and it has the login info. Ah, okay. So you I didn't try to click that. on, you have a ticket and there is nothing, but you have right. to read all the way through the bottom of the email for the Zoom. And, and you know what? It's the same link every week. 
So you can use the same link to come back every week. And the same um, password? Also, the same password, the same link for every week. Ah. And, and it's also right on my, on my uh, website on the Coffee with the Artist link. I have it all out there. Ah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, now I understand. Yeah. Yeah, but, I as well. Yeah, but you know, thank you for coming everybody. Um, and thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us. And we'll let you, go and you can go back to your classes. Yes. <laughs> All so right. you have a very good day. And uh, I may see you in a minute <laughs> if you are in my class. Thank oh, you so much, Suzanne, for having me. That was really lovely. Really nice moment to spend um, having a chat with everybody. So thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.